Well, good morning. morning. Justin, that was about the nicest um, introduction I've ever received, so thank you very much. Uh, That was very kind. And uh, on behalf of Nebraska Christian College, I bring you greetings. Uh, This church, the Wayne Christian Church, has had a long history with Nebraska Christian College, and we're grateful for that partnership. And um, look forward to sharing God's Word together with you this morning. If you have your Bible with you, we are going to read from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to start. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 50. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I'm one of those preachers that really doesn't need a microphone, so sometimes I think adding a microphone almost makes it worse, but I'll let you be the judge of that by the time we get done. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 15. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have today to consider living in light of this wonderful truth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and that the hope that energizes our lives is one of sharing together with him in that resurrected life someday. We pray that you will bless our time together with your word and with one another. This day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, This year marks the 40th anniversary of my graduation from Manhattan Christian College. So Marcia and I have been in full-time ministry a little over 40 years, which... I think any way you count that is a long, long, long time. And I find myself in this season of life where I am pouring into students like I was 40 years ago, now at Nebraska Christian College. I find myself often recalling things that my professors said that I felt like helped me be ready for a lifetime of ministry for him. I want to do the same thing for our students today. I recall sitting in a Christian doctrine class with a professor who has long since gone to be with the Lord, Professor Dr. James Van Buren. Dr. Van Buren was a very, he was a jovial sort, a very emotional person, uh, intellectually intimidating to this small-town Kansas boy who made his way to Manhattan Christian College. I remember him making a statement in class one day about truth that I didn't know for sure if he knew what he was talking about or not. I doubt that I was the first college student to ever question whether or not the teacher knew what they were talking about. He said something along this line. While we as Christians believe that all Scripture is truth, not all scriptural truth is of equal clarity 
value and importance or something along that line. Now, I, I wondered about that because I thought, was he saying that like some parts of the Bible are more clear than other parts of the Bible? After a lifetime of studying the Bible, I would have to heartily agree that he is right. But I think he was also saying that there are some parts of the Bible, because of their clarity, because they are central to who we are as Christians, like the resurrection of the dead, that these are like the core foundational things upon which our lives as believers and our life together as a church ought to be built. So it's one of these things that I want to talk about today, why I read the scripture that I read for us today. This, to me, this section, 1 Corinthians 15, and specifically this section that we read that speaks of Jesus' resurrection and our anticipated resurrected life as believers together forever with him, to me, that is like the foundation stone it's the cornerstone paul said it is the it is the core of what we believe and teach as people who are are christians followers of jesus christ make no mistake about it and i doubt that anybody here this morning would disagree this is the main thing about being a christian This morning, I want us to think a little bit about how we live in light of that truth. How do we live out this resurrected life in which we are beginning to experience it more and more as we progress in our relationship with him? And interestingly enough, Paul goes right into that as he moves into chapter 16. Only for Paul and for the Corinthians, it wasn't chapter 16. It was just the next thought that came to Paul's mind. And there in those next several sentences, paragraphs, thoughts, we find some great insight into fulfilling what he said to the church long ago. To live our lives in such a way that we are advancing the cause of Christ with everything that we have. To give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. How do we do that? We're going to mention three things today. There are others in the text, but I want to just bring three to your attention today. I hope you'll listen, and I hope you'll pay attention. I hope that we will together seek to apply these in our lives this week. I believe that if we aspire to these three things that we're going to talk about today, that the future is bright for us as believers and as a local church. On the other hand, what I've found personally, and I think I've seen this happen in churches too, when these principles are ignored, well, we just don't want to go there. Let's aspire to these things today. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, be generous. Paul speaks of generosity. In giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord, he says, be generous. Listen to what the scripture says, verses 1 and 2. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Well, when Paul talks about the collection, he's talking about the offering. He's talking about material support for ministry. And I want us to notice three things about our generosity first of all our generosity ought to be planned I don't know how it works with you but I know in our household whatever is planned has a much more likely likelihood of actually being lived out and accomplished than that which is not planned I know some of us are all about spontaneity and I get that 
But spontaneity just does not work for this guy. I'm not very spontaneous. Uh, and I have found that with giving, because giving is a, is a disciplined sort of thing, it requires planning on my part. And I would, I would guess on all of our parts. It should be planned. Secondly, it ought to be personal. That every one of us, each one, Paul says, should set aside a sum of money. And that it should also be proportional. He says, in keeping with your, with your income. Now, of course, he's talking about money. But stewardship, as we understand it as Christians, involves not just money, it does involve money, but it involves a whole lot more. Everything, in fact, that Jesus has entrusted to us by his Spirit, our time, our abilities, our gifts, our treasure, all those things. And we all, what a powerful thing it is. When you see, when you see the gifts of a group come together to accomplish a task, when you see resources come together from individuals for the greater good, we reinforce this idea that everybody is needed, everyone has a part to play, that we all have something to give. I want to encourage us, as Paul did 2,000 years ago, that if we're going to give ourselves fully to God's work in the days ahead, we need to be generous people. That means being willing to take a risk every now and again. I know that that can be a difficult assignment for some of us, especially if along the way we have experienced setback or loss, hurt or injury. You know, to live with a generous spirit is, is not to ignore that that sort of thing isn't a reality or that it isn't a possibility. It's just to recognize that the God who owns it all is greater and is able to supply us even when those times of our lives are known. Be generous. Secondly, be flexible. This part of the sermon is especially for me, so if, if you want to listen in, that is just fine, but this part is especially for me. My family refers to me as Flexi Bill. And uh, it's not a compliment, I don't think. The way they say it, I, I think they're being a little sarcastic. Uh, and I understand that. I like to plan. I like to have things organized. I like, I like to believe the myth that I can be in control of my life. So that's why I need this point. Maybe you do too. Paul says, beginning with verse 5, After I go through Macedonia... I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great, great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. All right, now, before we talk about flexibility, let me just, in verse 9, I want you to notice there, Paul says, a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. I love the spirit of the Apostle Paul, who did not take difficulty to mean that God had closed the door. Rather, he understood difficult challenges, even opposition is like, yep, this is exactly where God wants me to be because of the opposition, because of the difficulty I'm facing. You know, I don't know if you were like this. I grew up kind of with this understanding. I don't know where I heard it. It wasn't a biblical idea that, well, you know, if things get tough, well, God must be saying no to that. He, may be, he must be closing the door on that. And uh, I suppose that's possible, but just because things are difficult, that doesn't mean that we're to turn away from them. They may very well be God's invitation to us to trust in Him and allow Him to work through our weakness 
to accomplish the great good that he has in mind. Now, notice two things about the intentionality with which Paul approached his work for the Lord. First of all, he was a planner. I take great consolation in that as a planner. He made plans. He had dreams. He had hopes. He had people he wanted to see. He had tasks that he wanted to accomplish. But remember this about Paul. He also remembered that God has a plan that always superseded his own plan. Paul understood the truth of Proverbs 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I don't know about you, but in my life, that's, that's been a challenging lesson to learn and to embrace for my own life. You know, one of my favorite personal examples for this truth is the desire I've long had to do ministry with our... We have four children, two girls, two boys... I should say two young women and two young men now. They're all adults. And their third child, Mark, I remember when he had a call to ministry when he was in high school. Uh, you know, I just, I couldn't help it as a preacher. I, I thought, wow, wouldn't it not be cool for us to do ministry together? And you know, in every one of those scenarios that I had in my mind, I was like the leader the boss, the guy in charge, and he was the assistant, the helper, you know. That was my idea of what ministry would look like with our son, Mark. And, uh, I mean, after all, I have wisdom, I have experience, you know, I got all this going for me. He would gain so much from spending time with his dad, right? turns out <clears throat> at Jacob's Well, our, our community development nonprofit that we're involved with uh, in downtown Lincoln, it's exactly the opposite. Mark founded the ministry. He is the executive director. He is the leader. He is the big picture guy. In fact, we were talking with a person yesterday about the possibility of joining the team, and that's one of the things that I wanted that person to be clear on is that I'm not the leader. Mark is our leader. And Marsha and I come alongside and help. And you know, if, you, if, we were, if Mark and I were up here, if you had a chance to spend time with us uh, for very long, got to know what we were really good at in ministry and how we're kind of wired, you would say, Bill, God's plan is a lot better than your plan. And, and it has been. That's not to say that it hasn't been challenging at times. As his dad, there have been times when I thought I knew better than he did. Uh, there have also been times when we occasionally will, like, um, raise our voices uh, to one another. I don't want to create for you this idea that, oh, wow, you've just submitted to God's plan and everything is just peaceful and awesome with your ministry. No, we still have those moments where we have like stress and tension because we have, are not of the same mind, but we have found that when we're working, each of us, and together in, our, in those areas where we are strong, we are a lot more, we're able to complement each other more than we are to, to compete with each other. To be flexible about the work of the Lord. Be generous be flexible, and then the third one, be kind. To be kind. I want to read verses 10 and 11. All right. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. For he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt, send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, from what we know about Timothy, Paul's protege, Timothy, he was a young man who more than likely struggled with confidence, personally. Uh, to be sure, he seems to be a person who was a little timid. Now, that is not the worst character flaw in the world, but if you've ever struggled with that lack of confidence, lack of kind of being timid, a lot of times it, it, it can kind of be tied together with you know, we're, we're obsessing about ourselves and our perceived weakness. 
and how we won't measure up and that sort of thing. I know a lot of people who have struggled with that. So Paul gives instructions to the Corinthians to be kind to Timothy, this young man who is developing in his leadership as a minister. And we do well to do the same thing in our relationships with one another in the church because here is the thing, and I'm sure you know this, we all have personality quirks. We all have shortcomings of character. There's not a one of us in this room who is perfect. The truth is, some of us have had negative life experiences along the way that have left profound wounds that are still in the process of healing. That's why we're here to help one another, to bear with one another, to encourage one another. But we all know what it's like to come alongside someone who, when you get up next to them, it's kind of like rubbing up against a porcupine. All right? I can imagine what that would be like. You know, it's hard to get close to them without feeling like they are putting off something that is kind of prickly. You've heard the old adage, I'm sure, hurting people hurt people. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And so I'm trying to remind myself these days that when I encounter someone in life whose conversation seems kind of sharp and cutting, when their attitude comes across kind of negative, they may even be kind of physically threatening with their body language, I try to remind myself that this person is acting this way for a reason that I probably don't know what all has happened in their life up to this point in time. In fact, I may not know anything at all about it. And that this is an occasion for us to extend grace so that we can better help and better understand. What I mean is, instead of lashing back at people when they say things in a way or do things in a way that are hurtful and offensive, to be a church, a community where we listen to people like this, where we seek to understand folks like this, where we value them and gently try to encourage them and show them, you know what, there is a healthier, there's a better way of dealing with the hurts that we've experienced in life that are inevitable to all of us. We must learn to be kind to one another. And then a couple of verses later, in verses 13 and 14, I don't know that we have these on the screen, but I love the way Paul kind of just wraps this all up. When he says in verses 13 and 14, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. It's kind of like, you know, we started with, Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. And this is how you do it. Be generous. Be flexible. Be kind. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Stand for the truth. Love one another. How should we live in light of of the core foundational truth that is ours as believers, the resurrection hope we have in Jesus, Paul says we ought to give everything we have to and for our risen Lord. That our labor for him and with him is not in vain. He encourages us to be generous, to be flexible, to be kind to one another. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the wisdom of your word, for the instruction that you've given to us through scripture by your spirit. May these truths that we have heard this morning, may they find a place of resonance, of understanding, of application in each of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.